Alright, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Davis, I'm a KSU student here. Um, we have a quick thank you to our sponsors. Uh, Kennesaw State Department of Information Systems, uh, the NSA, uh, Coal Fire, and Kudelski Security. Um, so I'm proud to introduce our speaker, Ray Kelly. He's uh, got his presentation about mobile um, vulnerabilities. vulnerabilities. Yeah. <laughs> Great job, Davis. Uh, yeah, so welcome to B Sides, and thanks for coming to see my talk. Hopefully, you want to see some really bad mobile vulnerabilities that are out there. So, we'll definitely have some real examples of those, and we'll take a look at those. Uh, a little about me so, I've been developing for over 20 years, been just normal developer, so I've written plenty of vulnerabilities. I've uh, been in internet security for about 15 years, and I got my start at a company called Spy Dynamics that was founded here in Atlanta. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and at my role there, I was the lead developer of WebInspect. So I was like one of the early developers of the WebInspect. Anyone familiar with WebInspect at all? Mm -hmm. So I wrote most of that product in the, in the early days and kind of went through a whole ton of acquisitions from HP, HP Enterprise, now to MicroFocus, so kind of along that route. Uh, and along that route also, I uh, led our mobile pen test team in our Fortify On Demand area where we do cloud-based services. Uh, pen testing, so we test mobile apps, and so some of the examples we'll see here are some of the horrible things that we see, uh, that we saw coming through our uh, testing process. Uh, just a couple considerations, so everything we're gonna, uh, I'm going to show you today is already publicly known, <laughs> or it's been anonymized with scrub, so no zero days for you guys today. Uh, the other uh, takeaway here is that these vulnerabilities that we're going to look at, they weren't intentional. These aren't malicious actors that are trying to hack us, right? These are actually developers that are just writing code and not giving a lot of thought to security. And we'll go into some reasons why as well for that. Uh, so yeah, so these developers have the best of intentions. They're not trying to harm us, but we have these vulnerabilities. Talking about just insecure devices, this really has nothing to do with anything, but I love telling this story. I was watching the History Channel a long time ago, and they actually had stories on history. And they had a story about uh, this paper shredder, and it was back during the Cold War era. And what they did uh, was they, there was a hotel in Washington, D.C. where an important dignitaries would stay. So presidents, kings, what have you, they'd stay there when they were visiting the, the president. Uh, and in each of the hotel rooms, they were kind enough to provide them with a paper shredder, right? You have to shred your important documents while you're traveling. So the interesting thing about this, though, is this paper shredder was made by some three-letter acronym of our government. And what they actually had done was built in a, pa a scanning device at the top of the shredder. So as you're shredding it, it's scanning the document and actually sending it over the electrical line through like old school pulses, like the electrical pulses like a modem would do, and then reconstructing the document in another room in the, in the hotel. And I was like, that is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so the mobile landscape, I imagine most of you have uh, mobile devices at your company, or mobile apps, yes? And uh, I'm just curious, how many uh, pen testers do we have in here? Pen testers? Okay. How about QA folks? Any QA? Man, never. I want to see QA people at these security conferences. Uh, how about developers? Just straight up developers? Great. Uh, so as most of you know, mobile's hot. Everyone, every company wants their mobile app. They want it out there now, right, instantly. If anyone's going to put features over security, it's unfortunately mobile developers where it comes to, and there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, one is they're not trained in security typically, and a reason is because sometimes mobile apps are so easy to make. Look at Cordova and all these like drag and drop apps, right? You're just throwing together mobile apps. Man, this is great. I'm putting this thing together, and it's done, and they ship it out without really any regard to security. So uh, training in security for mobile developers doesn't happen that much. Uh, so those are some of the, the challenges that we have with mobile. The mobile landscape, we're looking at devices, uh, they are growing just insanely, right? We're at like 5 billion mobile devices 
in 2019, and that's just going to keep growing. So the number of apps are out there, think of that threat surface uh, on all those devices that you have your apps installed on. We did a case study where we took 120 mobile apps and we analyzed them for vulnerabilities and we found that 66% of them contained a critical or high vulnerability. And, uh, and when we say high, we're saying it either disclosed some PII that we found personal information. So for instance, if you use your mobile app, you logged in with your username and password or you filled out personal information within the app, we were able to get that from the device and pull it off because it was normally not encrypted. So clear text uh, storage. Or we were able to compromise the backend system. And that's sort of like the, where I have the most fun is on the backend systems because another thing when you're making a mobile app, the developers are putting it together and they create some backend endpoint, right? So your mobile device is gonna talk to an endpoint. And people think that, well, this isn't, this is just a, a RESTful service. It's not gonna be indexed by Google. No one's gonna know about it. Well, I guarantee you the bad guys are gonna know about it. They're gonna find that mobile backend and test for things like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, uh, as an open uh, web server that they can use to upload anything they want. And I'll have an example of that too that we actually saw. There's a, so when you talk about normal like application security and mobile specific security, there's two important differences. One is uh, you have a magnified network vulnerability or threat service. And what I mean by that is when you think about your mobile device and you're in the airport, right? Or you're in a hotel, you're traveling, man, I need to find some Wi-Fi, right? And you go find there's something that goes shady free Wi-Fi, click here to join, right? And you, know, and, you're, and you do, you have no idea what's happening after your data leaves your device. You know, you get onto it, and if you saw the talk just before this one, right? Someone's got their pineapple running, they're doing man in the middle, so you join that Wi-Fi and all of a sudden they're sniffing all your cookies, your credentials, everything you're sending over that network. So the idea of how easy it is to connect your mobile device to any network makes it uh, all that more important. The other one is the physical vulnerability. So, and this one's pretty easy, you leave your device somewhere, right? I left it somewhere. You forget it. Well, then if a nefarious person finds your device and they actually know what they're doing, who knows what they could get off your device if those app developers didn't do things properly. And again, I'll have examples of that. And uh, so this is kind of embarrassing, but we're all friends here, right? So I, can, I gave this talk to a user group for a company, and I got to this part, and I said, magnified physical vulnerability. And I go to pull out my phone, and it's not there. I'm thinking, oh my God, where's it at? And I'm looking around, and it's way back in the room and I, where I was sitting to watch a talk before this one, and I had left my phone back there on, on the table. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know, that's an example there, guys, of how that could happen. Like, they didn't buy it either. <laughs> so. so when we assess a, a, to do a proper assessment of a mobile app, there's three areas that we're looking at. We're looking at the client. What we mean by that is the mobile device. What are we looking for there? So if you have an app installed, the biggest one that we're looking for is unencrypted data. So when you type in your username and password and you hit go, is that app properly encrypting or protecting that data on the device? Um, poor certificate management, uh, what type of data is being stored? So those are some of the things that we look for on the device. The next one is the network layer. So the things we're looking for there, simple ones, are they using SSL, right? Are they encrypting the data to and from the endpoint? We're looking for backdoor uh, data leakage, you know? So say like you install a, uh, in your application, you want analytics, right? Well, if you install some app, uh, analytics library, say Crashlytics or, uh, or what have you, where's that data going and is that encrypted and what does it include? You know, because you don't always know, right? You just need analytics. It's easy enough to throw in uh, Firebase or what have you. But what data is that actually grabbing from your device and sending to the backend server? Are you leaking PII from the user? So that's an example there. And then we look at the server side, and I talked about that just a few minutes ago. We're looking for injection flaws, authentication, privilege escalation, SQL injection, all the normal web appy type vulnerabilities that everyone's familiar with. All of those apply to mobile backends as well. Nothing changes there. 
So uh, when, to do a proper test, you want to look at all of these layers to really ensure that you're, the entire app is safe. Any questions so far? Um, good. So let's start digging into vulnerabilities now. Uh, this is an example here. So again, we're talking about server-side vulnerabilities. And we did a test of a mobile application, and they had a back-end API, just like I was saying. It's not in, it was just a RESTful endpoint. There was no content there. It was just uh, API endpoints. And what they had found is uh, they had enabled WebDAV on there, so they allowed the put method. And so basically it turned their server into an open file share. We could put anything that we wanted there uh, and upload anything. So the example here is we actually did this as a real screenshot where we uploaded an HTML page <coughs> that had a hyperlink to evil link, which would contain most likely malware, let's say, that if you click on it. So what we would do is open this, uh, upload that file, copy the URL, because it actually has the company's name in, in it, right? Company.com slash our page that we uploaded. And then what we're gonna do is take that and then spam that out via email to, who knows, a million people through whatever service. And it looks like a legit link now in the email but yet it's our page that we uploaded. So you get an email, you go click on it. Oh, look here, free tickets, absolutely. Click on that, now you just got infected on your device or on your computer. And so the important thing though, is, again, this was specifically for a mobile API. It had nothing to do with anything else, but yet we were able to utilize it to exploit other users. Anyone hear about the British Airways hack? Happened last year, that was a big one. So uh, from a quarter, about a quarter million accounts were uh, compromised. And when we mean compromised, it, this was a bad one. They got billing addresses, emails, credit card numbers, the CVV code, your secret code uh, that you type in when you purchase something. And this one was really interesting. This one was pretty fascinating because it was originally an app for their website. Okay, so their website where you want to go buy a ticket for British Airways, you'd fill out this information. Well, uh, they were compromised, and the page that collected that information had a MageCart skimmer script installed. So I don't know if anyone heard of MageCart. Um, it's a script that basically, uh, when you fill out that information, there's some JavaScript that parses. Well, what it would do is it would take that information and send it over here to your server and to British Airways server. So the bad guys were getting copies of every single credit card transaction that was happening. So I don't know if the people that did this knew how much, how effective this was gonna be because the mobile app developer said, oh, I'm gonna use Cordova or some cross-platform thing and I'm just gonna drag and drop, hey, there's that script that does credit card transactions already on our server, so I'm gonna just pull that same script down into the mobile app and I'm going to use that, piece of cake. Well, that pulled down the same mage cart script, the credit card skimmer, into the mobile app. So now you went from one endpoint that's been compromised to hundreds of thousands. Everybody that had the British Airways app and bought a ticket had their credit card information stolen. That bought their ticket through there because they were sharing code from the server. Uh, so that one was kind of neat how that had happened. Another interesting thing, too, is this is one of the first instances of uh, GDPR. That was, this was like two months after GDPR was enacted in Europe. And I just Googled before this talk to see what the fine was. They were still, they were kind of blown away by, oh my God, this has already hit us. Um, I still have not seen a fine or what they got hit with. Um, but if you look at the rules and how many, you know, they charge per, the fine is per how many affected users were there, this would be staggering <laughs> from everybody that had the mobile app. So uh, I, I still haven't seen any info on what the penalties were on that. Here's another one. Uh, this is simple account enumeration. Okay, so uh, this uh, app was called Bright City and it was apparently a popular app for local governments. So let's say I live in Loganville, that's where I live. So the city would say, hey, you know, we're helping you protect your property. You know, there's been a lot of break-ins. What you can do is use this app to catalog everything in your house. 
Um, and it sounds crazy. <laughs> but in a way, you know, if your house ever burns down, I've kind of heard these before, you know, you want a catalog, you want pictures of what you had, so you have a record of what's important in your house that's worth money. So these governments were pushing this app onto everybody, saying, hey, this is really helpful for these cases if you get robbed, or if your house burns down, you have this evidence now of what's in your house, so you can go to your insurance company. Well, they had a, their back-end API for the mobile app didn't actually validate when you make calls that you're the actual user that logged in to make those calls. And it's kind of hard to see, but here's a call here to their API that says, get user, and you put in your ID, let's say it's one, and it comes back and it says, well, that's Ray. Even though you're Joe or you're Davis, it would say, well, you're Ray, and here's everything that came back, which included your phone number, your username, and your password to your account to Bright City. Now I'm gonna go get number two, number three, number four. I could own everybody's account through this, through this mobile API backend. And so I thought it was kind of funny. It's kind of Amazon for criminals, right? Man, I need to look for a flat screen TV, 52 inch. I'm gonna log into here and see what house has one. <laughs> and then I'm gonna go and try to break into their house and go get into something. So go find what I'm looking for. Oh, and something else to notice too, uh, this uh, is using SSL, it's, it's, so it's HTTPS. Uh, so the problem is that doesn't protect you from account enumeration, right? If I'm on the back end, if I'm the one hacking you, the only thing SSL do, is doing is helping hide me actually from the, the company that, that I'm attacking. You know, because it's going through the web app firewall, it's still encrypted, so uh, SSL actually didn't happen, uh, doesn't help in this case. So now we'll work on, uh, move our way now into the network layer. So now we're on to the next one. Uh, this was an example here uh, that we had. A, this mobile app was for a big time boy band. You know, so think of like New Kids on the Block. Any New Kids fans in here? I know we got one up there. My wife is here, so. Uh, so if you think about this, the target demographic for this app is like 12 to 16 year old girls probably for this boy band. And we're testing the app and our tester, so part of our testing process is we'll actually install the app on a device and run it through a proxy and watch what, you know, we're looking for data leakage, what's, what's happening, where's stuff going to. And stuff's flying by, and uh, all of a sudden the tester notices a, a request go by and, and it has his home address in there, down to the street number. One, two, three, here's street, I mean it was dead on and he never typed it into the app. Never even put it in there. And so what we were thinking is they were just using GPS or Wi-Fi location, you know, just to figure out what address am I at. But the, this company that made the mobile app or the boy band thought it was a great idea just to take that from you and send that to their servers. Mm -hmm. So uh, that one was pretty scary on that one. Is that a vulnerability? Maybe not. Certainly a privacy issue is if the user never agreed, you know, to give that sort of information by using the app. Another example, so I had written a tool, I was trying to uh, make something for our testers make, testing mobile apps is painful, right? There's a lot of setup involved, you have to do, you know, to try to get in the middle. You know, if, if your developers are doing things properly and actually pinning the certificate and everything's done properly, it just makes it a little more difficult, so it's painful. So I was trying to find ways to make this easier and I had taken the Android operating system, so I thought, well, maybe I'll just make my own Android operating system, right, that we can install the app on. So I took the source code and made some modifications where I would intercept things from it, like any time a network request is left for the device, I'm gonna grab it before SSL encryption occurs and, and log it. So that way we can install the app and just see what, what's happening as far as the network traffic goes. So I install a popular uh, social networking app. I won't say which one it is, but it was social networking related and I'm testing it. I just started testing it. I was like, cool man, there's some stuff going on. All of a sudden I see this chunk of data go out. And I was like, oh my God, something just happened. Something blew up. Something must have gone wrong. And I start looking through this chunk of data and I know you guys can't read it, but to read some of the things I got highlighted in red, Wi-Fi info, home screen uh, mode, is your Wi-Fi enabled, screen brightness, uh, key guard type, for instance, is your, are you using, uh, what kind of 
security you're using to get in, right? You're, are you using a PIN code? Uh, how much free space is on my SD card? Uh, let's see, what else is in here? Uh, what kind of camera configurations are on the device? <laughs> so by using this app, they just pilfered all of this information about my device and some of the setup and just took that, you know, without my knowledge. Um, so again, that was kind of an example where they're just taking information. Developers thought that would be a good idea, and maybe their terms of service allows it, but I certainly didn't care for it, care for that to see that happen. Uh, Bose headphones. So this one came out, and uh, what they were doing is so all these new fangled ear headphones, right? They have mobile apps, so you can do the EQ, you can configure things. Well, apparently the other thing they do is steal your listening habits and what songs you're listening to and take that information and send them up to their server also. So again, you don't, it, it clearly doesn't show that in the app, but yet they are doing that in the background. Yes? Sorry to interrupt. I think for that last one, it might have been for doing use of fingerprinting. Might you sometimes see what people, seeing what fonts people are using on their laptops and mobile devices to determine like unique fingerprint for different users? I, they certainly could. Uh, my first thought, though, for the last one, for the social yeah. networking uh, one, my first thought, though, was marketing, you know, selling information, you know, uh, or even think of advertising, right? So it sent up how much free disk, uh, 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 disk space I had on my device. You know, I'm scrolling through my, my profile, you know, post, and all of a sudden here's an ad for, hey, you need a new SD card? Here's, you know, blah, blah, blah. So they can actually target me directly from that kind of data. You know, or tell that I'm on an older device and all of a sudden I start seeing ads for <coughs> new phones that are coming out. So, or just selling that information to other marketing firms uh, or even device manufacturers. How many people, you know, what user base is using Android versus iOS? They could sell, uh, it's just money, you know, all that information. That was kind of my first thought, but I could certainly see fingerprinting as well, easily. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the client side. So now we're talking about the device itself. Uh, Starbucks mobile app users. <laughs> uh, so this one's a, quite a few years ago, but it was kind of a big one that, it, it was crazy. There's like four big mobile vulnerabilities that came out in a row. Uh, and this was one of them. Does anyone remember this? The, they, the announcement about a, the Starbucks mobile app had some issues? Well, so they... Starbucks coffee. <laughs> I'm a Dunkin' Donuts coffee man myself. So uh, the crux of this issue was that the developers use Crashlytics. Most people do that, right? So they add that so they can into their into their project. And but what they chose to do, so Crashlytics, you can log anything you want. You can, you know, it's there to track issues and such. So they were recording the screen where you log in. So when you would hit log in after you type your username and password, it would log what that HTML page looked like at that time. So unfortunately, it, it included the account username and the account password. And that was actually being sent to Crashlytics, you know, unintentionally. I mean, they probably never even thought that that was really gonna happen. Um, they were probably just trying to log stuff and they unintentionally grabbed usernames and passwords and started sending that to a third party now. I'm sure no one there was looking at it, but just the idea that that got leaked out. So, uh, and it was kind of funny, so the press, uh, whoever put this out, uh, issued a release. You know, when reached Wednesday, Crashlytics, a Boston-based firm that specialized in crash reporting solutions, couldn't comment on the specific customers, but did reiterate that the firm doesn't recommend developers log sensitive information. <laughs> so, I, that's not our problem. <laughs> the, the solution is don't do that. Uh, logging, so this is a great one our testers use. We always see all kinds of stuff. So if you're doing a debug logging, console.write, that sort of thing in your mobile apps, a lot of the times developers don't take those messages out before they ship them up to the app store. And so you can find lots of good information there. And this is an example of one here where we actually saw a username and passwords being written out uh, to, the device, uh, to the console log also. So it's sort of developer stuff that they just don't think to take out. So that's a, an easy target there.
So, uh, this was a good one. This, this uh, issue has been pretty much eradicated now with sandboxing and some, uh, some things that have been done over the past couple of years, but we used to get a lot of banks, right? Back when mobile apps were just coming out for banking, uh, for banks, and they had that feature where you can take a picture of your check, right, and deposit it. Well, we tested the app and we, they sent it to us, said, hey, hurry up, man, we're putting this thing in the app store, let us know, you know, we're, we're gonna hopefully do this today. Well, okay, well, we gotta test it. So we end up testing it. What we found is when you take a picture of the check, it was storing it to the global camera roll, not the sandbox or the, the applications directory. So any app had access to these checks and things that were being, uh, for the pictures that were being taken. Uh, so we sent it back and said, whoa, 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 you guys have a, a bad vulnerability. Don't, don't do that. And so they go, oh, yeah, okay, we got that. So they sent it back the next day and said, we fixed it. And by the way, we're submitting this to the App Store right now. Test it, you know, because we're in a hurry. And again, that goes back to that pressure that developers are under to get their mobile apps out, you know. So uh, we said, okay, so we test it again. And, it and they did. They fixed that issue. But what we had found is when we went into another feature, you could actually go into an area where you could see what's been, what has gone through your, your bank account. And you can swipe through deposits and such that have been in there. So you just keep swiping. And as you're swiping, it's writing each one back to the global camera roll again. Uh, so it was storing everything back there. So uh, you were like, no, don't. So we sent that back again. But kind of an example of, the, again, the pressures uh, that they're under. This is pretty hard to come by now. It's actually kind of hard to get out of your sandbox these days uh, when you're storing data for your application. So much more rare. Client debug screen. So this one's interesting. Uh, you know, with different tools, there's one called Flex for iOS, where it'll let you uh, wrap the any application basically and get into certain aspects of it. It'll it'll tear apart the memory. It'll look let you look at variables that are stored within the application. And one of those is you can actually trigger activities or uh, storyboards or screens within the app that aren't visible always. So a lot of the times, for to be helpful, the developers will put in a secret. So if I log in as admin in the app, there'll be an extra menu item, let's say, that says debug, where I can get in there and look at, look at certain things. And some of the ones that we were able to find that had come through is like, you know, disable cert pinning. Um, let's see, what else did that one have? That was the, uh, it for this one. Uh, upload log file and send. And what we found on that particular one for this application is the back end didn't validate at all what was being uploaded. So we, we sniffed that, we uploaded a, a log file, and we said, okay, here's the endpoint, and we uploaded a JPEG, anything, and it accepted it. So kind of like earlier, it became, it became an open uh, OneDrive for us, or Dropbox, uh, because of this feature. So, uh, and we had another one over here. Uh, let's see what this one had. Oh, this one here, it allowed you to change between production, staging, or canary, or like QA. Well, that just tripled my threat surface <laughs> for this application. Now I got three servers to go attack and find vulnerabilities on. Uh, so being able to find information in these debug screens is a big one. And one of the big ones that we do, uh, that we tell people is, you know, don't ship those. If these are in the App Store versions of these apps, or they were at the time that you know, before, before you build for uh, the App Store, take those screens out or make it a conditional compile statement that removes that activity uh, so they don't get shipped with the application. So this one's one of my favorites uh, that we had run across. Uh, I saw a talk this morning and it was mentioned uh, where they were talking about uh, Alexa's and, and voice recognition and such and so he kind of touched on this vulnerability as well so we had an app and this app was so secure it used voice recognition to log in and so you would go in and say log in and say hi my name is Ray because I had recorded that and it would let me into the app and it actually worked other people would try it you know we couldn't get around it, it seemed pretty legit that it was working so one of our testing procedures that we do is when we use an app, we'll take a snapshot of the app's directory on the device. Okay, here's what it looks like. There's, let's say, 20 files in there. And then we'll use the app for a while. I'll record my login, I'll go use it. Okay, now I'm gonna take another snapshot. Oh look, there's 25 files that exist. 
Well, those five files interest me <laughs> now. So I'm going to go look at each one of those. And we ran across one file that made no sense. It was like zebra.xyz. The file name, the extension, none of it made sense. And so we opened it up into a hex editor or just a notepad just to see what's in it. And it's all garbage. It's just completely binary mess. And I thought, okay, well, either it's encrypted, which is great, or you know, there's some other usage for it, but it doesn't look. And then wait a minute, let me see here at the near the top of this file. And we start seeing clear text words like genre, year made. Title. Anyone? MP3. MP3 files. So what, we, so what the tester did is he took the file, copied it off onto his computer, renamed it to MP3, held the phone up, hit play, hi, my name is Ray, and boom, got into the application. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that. So uh, an example of where uh, security through uh, ob uh, obfuscation, right? I'm going to rename it to something that doesn't make sense, and no hacker will ever find that vulnerability. So, going to go through some, uh, just a couple of resources. So, OWASP, so what, this is all related to application security. You know, we're talking about social networking, networking security. Um, my favorite, of course, because of WebInspect and is app security. Um, so, and this falls right in line with that. So, OWASP is a great resource for that. They have an OWASP top 10 for mobile apps specifically. So, if you want to go see what's the hottest, you know, what are the hot vulnerabilities right now, you can check out OWASP for that. And let's see, is that? Uh, this one here actually. So this one's kind of out of date, but I think it still works. It's called Goat Droid. So if anyone's heard of Web Goat uh, for testing uh, web applications, they have Goat Droid, which is actually a vulnerable Android app. And so you can install it, and there's a course where you go through and actually hack the application and go through the different steps to identify things. Uh, so that's a, that's a good resource on that one. And I had mentioned the OWASP Mobile Security Project, which has the top 10 listed on it, and a whole bunch of resources and tools as well for testing mobile apps. And that is the end of the presentation. You can follow me on Twitter. It's BB is best. There goes the rest of my credibility on the window. <laughs> but uh, follow me there. And uh, I'm open for questions since we have plenty of time, I think. Anyone? Yes. Uh, which platform do you find more vulnerable? That's a, I get that question all the time, and that's, that's tricky. So these vulnerabilities that we're talking about here today, it doesn't matter. If the developer is not encrypting your information on the device, it doesn't matter what device you're using. Um, so these developer mistake issues isn't really specific to any one platform. What, it, what I do find different, though, is malicious actors, people that are uh, uploading uh, Angry Birds, a malicious, malicious version of it. Uh, I think you'll find plenty of research that says Android is definitely worse in that case, that there's much more malicious apps out there. Um, it just seems that uh, Apple's review process seems to be more thorough. So I would say in that case, you know, iOS for, for malicious activity is a little bit safer, but for these type of developer mistakes, it, it doesn't really fit that fit that mold, I don't think. Well, I mean, there's, there's, aren't there some libraries that would be a little more akin to uh, making it easier for people to develop secure applications <coughs> on either Android or on iOS? Or no. Push, yeah, grab no. What you get and go with it. You kind of grab what you get. I'm not familiar with any libraries that make your app secure off the top of my head. Yeah. You know, you're just using Java Eclipse for Android or using Xcode. You're, you're writing your app. Yeah. And there you go, right? And, and by the way, you're including a whole ton of open source probably, which has its own right yes. <laughs> set of issues yes. as well. Yes. So, yeah. Do you have a question? Uh, I guess I'm sort of on that same religious store topic. Um, the Apple App Store, do you find that they catch anything that maybe isn't? Uh, you know, are, are they actually catching, hey, you wrap this thing in, in that debugger or you've got a bunch of extra screens? Yeah, they don't catch those. I believe they do catch things like blacklisted websites and anything they can find in that case. But again, if a developer makes a bad decision and stores an image to the global camera roll or to your, you know, your, your camera roll in general, they're not going to flag. They don't know what the user's storing, right? It's sort of, 
it's unknown at that point. So these are much harder, but for malicious apps that they can scan and look for uh, you know, fingerprints or signatures of malware, they will flag those and remove those, but not for developer bad decisions, let's say. Or uh, for instance, uh, the Crashlytics example where Starbucks was sending the username and password, you know, Apple's not gonna see that or care about it. You know, they don't have people that are using the app. Yeah, it's more that, that example you had of the, the hidden screens that was in. Right, yeah, they will not fly that because that's legit. It's not a great idea, but you certainly could do that. So they wouldn't remove that or, or flag that for any reason. Yeah, how can you test these for these vulnerabilities? For example, the SAS tools or anything like 45 cannot test for these. Like, for example, your app sending data to a server Correct. you shouldn't... Be so sending it to? to test the backend server, that one's pretty easy actually. So basically, you can use anything: Burp, Web Inspect. Ch uh, take your choice, right? Weapon of choice for for web application testing, and basically just proxy your app through that tool. Now audit, right? That's and it's right. going to go find SQL injection, cross site script, parameter injection, what have you. Uh, for the device itself, those walls that you're right, that is tougher, and that's much more of a manual process. And it is for us too. We've written some tools to make that easier. So we all we work on all jailbroken and rooted devices that we install the apps on, and we have tools. So as we're using it, we're capturing information, things that are interesting, uh, to make it easier. But yeah, there's no like tool that you can really buy that would go do that. So those tools you said it's all your company uh, custom tools you have. Correct you don't for the sell device the, yeah. parts. Okay. There's right. no nothing you sell. Right, and and you will see the network portion as well. With on your own that you can do easily. Again, if you're using Burp or Web Inspect or App Scan or whatever, you'll be intercepting that traffic, and you can see data going to Crash Lakes or to the target end server and see sensitive information there. So those sort of things you can do yourself pretty easily. Right. Uh, but the on-device things is kind of a challenge. Yeah, I think we are worried about mostly on the logic flaws, right? Not the security. Security flaws are easy. Some of these SaaS tools can find, but any of these logic flaws, somebody manually has to look at it. That's correct. That is right. the hard part. Yep. I don't know. It's no easy solution. Right. Um, I don't know, a year or so ago I read something about uh, not one app is vulnerable, but attackers were using multiple apps. So if you had multiple apps, like a foreign attacker was using, that there was, they would build a different vulnerability in each app, and when they all came together, do you know anything about it? I have not heard of that one. It sounds legit, though. I mean, it was, it was something of that effect. I was wondering if you knew anything about it. Right, I do not. Sorry. Oh, goodness. Okay, we'll go across. Yep. When you're capturing network traffic, you mentioned um, a bird proxy or, or a Z attack or whatever you want to use. How is the app going to handle SSL certificate? Uh, they will install a root certificate for you on the device. And I know in WebInspect we do. So when you start a mobile scan, for instance, a mobile backend scan, you just hit a QR code that we show, and it will download our certificate. And then we can man in the middle in that case. And Burp has the same thing, I believe, that you can install a, uh, a root certificate on the device to get in the middle. Right. Yeah. Uh, that still works because when you install the root certificate from Burp, for instance, it'll go through that. Um, and on the correct, yeah, and the fingerprint, right? It could be the fingerprint. Correct. You couldn't see at all. That that is tougher. There's trend going on with that. Yeah, and that's a good trend. It makes our job harder, right? <laughs> when you actually pin the host, for instance, that is validating that you're talking to the right host. There's a couple things about that. Uh, one is you can disable it from the device if you have a rooted or jailbroken device. There's tools out there to disable cert pinning for apps. Um, but you have to have a rooted or jailbroken device for that. And the other one is that's really rare that we see that. And it's interesting that they actually pin the cert. And the reason for that is because they're QA teams. It's a pain in the ass, right? Because for every QA server, you have to have another certificate, another certificate. The developer goes, let me help you out. I'll just allow any cert. And, and then they don't put the pinning back before they put it in the app store. And so that is a rare case for us that we do see certificates being properly pinned. Uh, coming across? Yep. 
Yeah, so a quick question on your slide where you were talking about the 66% maps that you would kind of find Correct. kind of moment. Was that all in the application code or um, configuration itself, or was some of that in like failure to update when new third party um, software is available, like OpenSSL or something like that? So it was actually phones coming in through. I don't think we separated based on that. Uh, that's a good question, though. So. Um, yeah, open source will get you for sure. I don't think we dis, uh, parse that out in that in that research as to what was open source. Kind of knowing those numbers. That, um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Though. Uh, you find a lot of people implementing encryption poorly. Uh, well, I I would say well, uh, it's kind of weird when you just say encryption. I mean. With our mobile apps, we're just talking about SSL. If you're talking about encryption, is but are you talking about data storage? Data storage. We're seeing that most people don't do anything on top of what the device provides. You know, so Apple, and actually that's pretty good, right? Especially on Apple, uh, where it's actually secure to your user. It's encrypted for your user on the device. So we don't see too much where people go out of the way to put their own encryption on top of that, because um, that's sort of by default, right? You get that for free. So. Yes. We haven't uh, done any research on that. Um, yeah, we haven't done research on that, but I don't know if I would see a big difference in that, other than just one's easier to make mistakes in probably than if you're working in Xcode and you know Objective C and, and writing that code. So. Yes. So I was uh, doing a research. I got an application which was uh, saving its username and password in an encrypted form in the device. So what I did is I hooked the application. And when I was seeing for the logs, the application was decrypting that uh, username and password at the runtime when uh, we were entering, performing any of the transaction in the application. So I just wanted to know about the uh, what scale do, do we add it as to be like high, low, or medium? Because the data is properly encrypted and stored, and I'm a only able to get when I'm hooking the application. Right. So are you doing like a memory dump of the application to get it? Or um, how are you getting? So like oh, they set up the flex. on the device. Yeah. So oh. I just connected it with my laptop. I'm doing <laughs> the reverse engineering and checking for the locks, any of the runtime uh, screen locks, and all what it is doing. Yeah, and yeah. hooking of the function, like there was a function which was decrypting it at the runtime. Right. Like two string and all from uh, the encrypted value to the two string value. And they were writing it unencrypted to the device after they... Not to the device, but yeah, I was able to hook the function and the function was giving me that output. Oh, yeah. So no, I... how are you going to rate it? If it's it just in the high, function... It, yeah, it has to be decrypted at some point for the app to use it. And that, that sounds legit to me. I don't. I wouldn't see that as a vulnerability. I mean, um, I mean, look at how would you exploit that, right? You'd actually have to lose your device. Somebody have to get into it, hook up the tools to inject the functions or to wrap the functions, and then use it. Um, so you know, as far as exploiting that would be really tough, I think. But I, again, it has to be decrypted at some point. Um, so if we are storing the decryption, like in. Uh, the username is being username and the password is stored in the device. Yes. And we are decrypting there. There is a uh, function which is decrypting that in the device. So, if I get any of the files where it is being stored, if I uh, for your uh, I can say like your username and password, I get that file from your device. I know the algorithm. Can't I decrypt it for the other users? I don't think mm -hmm. so. Uh, if you grab it out of the the app sandbox. Yeah. Um, I mean, I that should be encrypted. If not, so they're doing something. There is a decryption algorithm in the application itself. Right. So I can just provide the your username encrypted data and then try to try to decrypt that also. I think I'd have to know more about that scenario. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Any more? Uh, we're hiring, by the way. We've got like 30 open <laughs> positions for <laughs> real. So we're looking for sales engineers. We're looking for developers. Um, so also, if you guys are looking for something, hit me up. So uh, yes, that's it. Thank you very much.